And speaking of double standards, U.S. leaders now urging governments abroad to embrace Internet freedom. Today, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was at The Hague to advocate Internet freedom. And today, as people increasingly turn to the Internet to conduct important aspects of their lives, we have to make sure that human rights are as respected online as offline. And in the past, President Obama has also urged other countries to open up freedom of speech on the web. The more freely information flows, the stronger the society becomes. Because then citizens of countries around the world can hold their own governments accountable. But at the same time, the U.S. is making moves to tie in Internet security right here at home. Federal law enforcement and national security aiming to get new regulations uh, that would make it easier for them to wiretap Internet communications. So that includes email, Facebook, Skype, and other sites. The mandate would allow the U.S. to wiretap these sites. So how can the U.S. promote Internet freedom in other countries yet restrict those same freedoms here at home? Here in studio to talk more about this associate editor at Reason Magazine. Mike Riggs, thanks for joining us, Matt. Um, so we just heard um, from both Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and um, President Obama. Um, they are pushing for, for other countries to, to spread this freedom of the Internet. Um, but at the same time, the U.S. is, is cracking down on these same freedoms. Um, so, so why the double standard? Um, I mean, there, I think there's always some cognitive dissonance between what the U.S. is promoting in terms of foreign policy and then what we're doing domestically. Uh, I, you know, you can attribute this to a couple things. One, uh, the, the agencies that are responsible for um, not violating Internet freedom at home, I'm not going to say protecting it, I'm going to say not violating it. Uh, it's not the State Department, you know, it's the NSA, it's the Department of Justice, um, it's local law enforcement. So on the one hand, um, and then it's also, you know, the Congress that is responsible for sort of like either creating laws that protect internet freedom or more often than not uh, creating laws that chip away at it. So you have that sort of dissonance and then the State Department, you know, is not concerned with domestic matters. Uh, the other reason I think we see this is that um, as, as terrifying as some of these laws are that, that the Congress is proposing, um, the Stop Online Piracy Act is one of them, this, uh, this bill that is currently in the subcommittee that would allow wiretapping of digital communications, making that easier. Um, I think the other reason that that stuff is not, it's just not quite as bad as what you see in Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's not a degree of hypocrisy there. Uh, what we're talking about when we look at these domestic policies that we're facing is sort of our, uh, our right to be left alone, sort of being infringed on, right? I mean, nobody's going to tell us the, what sites we can and can't visit what we can say over Gchat. Really what these policies do is they expose us to interference in our day-to-day -day lives when we say something through digital communications that looks like terrorism or looks like a crime. Whereas in these other countries, the, 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 it's of just a much lower base level of freedom. It's this idea that uh, in China, there are just sites you can't visit. You know, in the Middle East, there's words that if you type, you know, that you can't search uh, in a search engine and stuff. So um, th there's dissonance there, but it's far enough apart that we sort of have the luxury of being able to lecture these countries about what they should and shouldn't be doing. Right. Um, and uh, you, uh, as we just heard, uh, Secretary of State Clinton lecturing these other countries, um, you know, um, saying they, they shouldn't be disabling Twitter and, and other types right. of communications. Um, um, that they are using to to organize um, and their demonstrations over there in Tahrir Square, um, but it's not like this is totally unheard of in the U.S. Um, something happened in, in California back in September where where cell phones are disabled. So I know um, you're kind of aware of, of situations um, right here in the U.S. where. where right. The similar things have happened. Yeah, the Bay Area Rapid Transit, which we know by the acronym of BART, uh, which oversees the transit system in the Bay Area in California, shut down cell phone service uh, during the beginning of the Occupy protest because they saw on Twitter and other social networks that uh, protesters were going to uh, try and move uh, from one protest area to another via the transit system. And, uh, you know, BART got, uh, again, BART is uh, sort of. Uh, a militarizing police agency, which we saw right now. I mean, they had an incident where they shot a restrained suspect, I think, two years ago. Um, but w w what BART decided to do was they, they shut down cell service. They didn't actually have a policy regarding this. Uh, after the fact, 
they came up with a policy saying anytime public safety is in jeopardy, we reserve the right to, to restrict cell service. And uh, the Federal Communications Commission, which is currently headed by a Democrat, just to show that this is completely nonpartisan, um, said, uh, you know, that's great, as long as it's for preserving public safety. So in the U.S., we have the public safety argument here, and then in parts of the Middle East that have restricted access to social networks. Um, it's more, it's also being wrapped in that same language. The, the, the real point, I think, is actually to prevent regime change which is what they're going for over here. And again, this is just basically us being on opposite sides of this issue, though we are moving much closer together. I think eventually we'll see these countries liberalize. And unfortunately, I think we'll see U.S. Internet policy and communications policy get more restrictive over time. I mean, we'll have fewer negative rights to be left alone on the Internet. So you're saying that we are moving in the direction of these countries that, that we kind of criticize and yes, and I think they're also moving towards us at the same time. I, I know it's uh, in, in the, probably the place that a lot of world governments are going to find themselves maybe five or ten years down the road is, is one where a place like you're much freer to use the Internet in China and much less free in your um, Internet activities, or at least you're going to have to be much more cautious in the United States. And you just mentioned what happened in California right. um, and, and with this new push um, to, to regulate the Internet. Um, do you think that, that we'll, we, we might see more, more instances uh, like this? Um, there's definitely a possibility. I think as of right now, the, 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 the people who see nothing wrong with restricting Internet freedoms, um, I, I don't think their primary interest right now is being able to shut down access. In fact, I think they actually like the idea of us using as many social networks as possible because what they want to do is they want to eavesdrop. They want to be able to sweep for data. They want to be able to uh, you know, quote unquote, prevent threats before uh, they happen. Um, so it's, I, I honestly think that the sort of prevailing ideology regarding uh, internet censorship is one to like actually let people say as much as they want, then let us watch, let us collect it, and then let us do whatever we want with that information, whether that's um, indefinite detention or whether that's shutting down websites. But th there's definitely the, the prevailing ideology is let this get out there and then let us react however we want to it. Very interesting, Mike. Thank you so much for weighing in on this. That was Associate Editor at Reason Magazine, Mike Riggs.